In this webcast, we'll take a look at where these carbocation rearrangements will occur within our SN1 and E1 type mechanisms. In this particular example, we have an alkyl chloride reacting with methanol. However, that oxygen is not substituted where we think it would be. It's actually one carbon over. And to find out exactly why this occurs, we take a look at the mechanism. Every step that's going to occur is an elementary step that you've seen before. In this first step, as we see with SN1 steps all the time, the first step is going to be that DN step, that dissociation of that nucleophile. That leaving group leaves, that Cl-. Therefore, we're left with a carbocation. And any time you see a carbocation in a mechanism, you should always consider rearrangements. In this case, we have a secondary carbocation. Can we rearrange this carbocation with a 1-2 shift to create a more stable carbocation? If the answer is yes, then that carbocation rearrangement is going to occur. If that answer is no, then you're not going to have a rearrangement. In this case, we have a secondary carbocation, and we can do a hydride shift and move that blue hydrogen group over to that carbocation. And based on this rearrangement, we took it from a secondary carbocation over to a tertiary benzylic carbocation. So not only did we improve it from a secondary to a tertiary, but we also added resonance delocalization to help out that positive charge. So we have definitely gone downhill to form a more stable intermediate, and that's the reason why this rearrangement occurred. So now, you ask yourself, is this tertiary benzylic carbocation the most stable it can be? Can we create a more stable carbocation with a 1-2-R shift? In this case, no, we cannot. So therefore, we move on with what we still have in our mechanism. We have this high-energy intermediate, the high-energy carbocation. We also have a nucleophile in solution, methanol. So therefore, we have an AN step, an association of this nucleophile. That oxygen lone pair attacks that carbocation. It's N to A sigma type interaction, followed by a proton transfer step to lead to our final product. So the elementary steps involved in this mechanism were a DN, followed by a 1,2R, an AN, and then a PT. And those elementary steps that we know all about form this product that we see from this SN1 mechanism. So I want you to be sure every time you're working a mechanism, if you see a carbocation as an intermediate, Always ask yourself, can this carbocation rearrange? So in this example found on the ChemTube 3D website, we can take a look at the ring expansion shown down here in rearrangements for ring expansion. In this particular model, shown here in 2D here at the bottom, we can take this four-membered ring and do a ring expansion of the carbocation to make a five-membered ring, therefore releasing some ring strain contained within that molecule. Now let's take a look at actually how this is going to work in three dimensions. We're taking that bond between 1 and 4 and we're moving it over to make a bond between 1 and 5. Now you may think we have a tertiary carbocation and we're only going to a secondary. However, the amount of energy gained in that ring strain release is going to outweigh that difference between a secondary and a tertiary carbocation. So if we were to take a look at this animation, we can take a look at this bond moving between 1, 4 to 1, 5. So as it moves from 1, 4 to 1, 5, and then moves back from 1, 5 to 1, 4, this is just going to show you the geometry of this particular rearrangement step. Note how this carbocation on 5 is being rehybridized from sp2 to sp3. And the same is occurring for the carbocation on 4, which is trigonal planar. Now it's back to being tetrahedral. So feel free to play around on this ChemTube 3D website. So that way you can see exactly how these orbitals are going to arrange themselves for this 1-2-R step. So whenever you come across any reaction with a carbocation, always think about rearrangements.